Welcome to another in the series of AI Med Talks. We are having a chat to Dr. Mukesh Haikawal in sunny Melbourne. I won't say sunny, it's not sunny. My name is Alexi Boyd. I am, of course, a radio host and broadcaster and very proud to be sitting here alongside uh, Dr. Heikewal talking all about his passion for AI Med, his experience and what it is that he's going to bring along to, um, I guess, help bring the AI Med movement to Australia. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. So let's talk a little bit about your passion for AI Med. Where does it come from? What's your background and why do you think it's so important for the nature of healthcare in Australia? So for me, the term AI health is basically a progression of where we've come from, from zero use of technology in health to a little bit of use of technology in health um, at the beginning of the 90s to 98% of adoption of technology in a clinical setting, in general practice, in Australia, um, in the last 15 years. Significant change. So there has been significant change. That's quite positive, um, considering we're still looking at a movement that's got a long way to go. Indeed. And so the AI movement as it is today, it will be building on or riding on the shoulders of those who have been before, the giants that I had the pl pl privilege of working with and working on their shoulders. Um, I think that the... Um, technology and health uh, piece has been quite bitty. So we've got very good adoption within general practice. We've got very poor adoption uh, in, the, in the clinical space with non-GP specialists and even less so in the allied health um, specialists area. Um, we have some hospitals who are really excelling in this and other hospitals are not excelling at all. But whatever they might do within their consulting rooms or within their operating theatres or within the hospital system, they're still not connecting with the outside world. And that's with the you and I, the um, end user, the patient, the consumer. Um, and I think all of these things have to be aligned to make the best out of the use of technology and health, which is now called AI. Um, I suppose the thing about AI is, you know, where are we now compared to just electro having electronic records, um, is how we glean information from the records, how we uh, use artificial intelligence to help guide us better about best outcomes for patients, uh, and that's from getting good information about patients and having good algorithms within our systems from gathering information from around uh, the whole environment to give us the best parameters to help improve that treatment journey. Um, we see this much more with personalised medicine. We see it much more where in, in things like um, specific cares for specific cancers. You know, we've seen the whole breast e uh, cancer issue change dramatically where some people don't even need to have breast surgery or don't need to have chemotherapy because of the sort of cancer that's been detected. And of course, we have conversely people who are detected in another way using the genomics and the um, the artificial intelligence that underpins that to say, actually, you need this kind of chemotherapy, not that chemotherapy, uh, or you've got homosectomy, uh, and so on. But the whole ballpark is no longer just a, you know, finger into the air and think, oh, that sound looks all right to me, John. It's very much more um, uh, codified. And I think that's the difference. We're getting more uh, used to uh, using our instruments better. You know, it's like a pilot who will now trust their um, dashboard um, and not say, oh, I don't trust the, the, the radar, I'll just do it myself and fly by the seat of my pants. Those days have gone. And is that because as a society as a whole, we're starting to use AI in different ways? We understand the purpose of big data and where we fit into that. Do you think that's what's trickling through to that effect? Yeah, I think the penny started to drop, especially in my sector, that um, people were using words like big data, for, you know, 3D printing. And people think, what is all this? I know nothing about this. But when you boil it down, it's the sort of stuff we're doing already. You know, we all use uh, a smartphone within our uh, consultations. Uh, we use a smartphone with, for our daily life, for organising appointments. And we use it to book things and, to, and, and so on. So there's many ways that we're already using it. We're didn't realise we were using AI, um, and it's do, taking the next step um, and bringing it into our day-to-day -day workflow. And I guess bringing that into day-to-day -day healthcare is, is where the transition is so comfortable. Yeah, so the, the, the need for this is obvious. Uh, we can't keep doing work today the same way that we have done for the past 20 years. We have a significant change in our uh, demographics. We have uh, people are getting older, and I will say that's a good thing. That's what we're all aiming to do. We all want to get older, but we want to do it in a healthy way. We want to do it in a way that's sustainable uh, for, 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 for longevity, um, and we want to do it so we don't have to um, uh, get sick when we get older. We want to be thriving when we're getting older. Um, and then we've got multiple 
chronic and complex care needs. People have got many different diseases. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which I once chaired, um, says that one in two Australians, yeah, that's 50% of Australians have got something called a chronic disease. Uh, and um, you know, one in uh, 20% have got at least two. So it's a significant number of people have got that. So we've got chronic complex care, we've got aged care, we've got new technologies to treat people. We've got new chemotherapies, immunotherapies for cancers. We've got things you do to protect people if they have heart disease. You have things for people who've got stroke to prevent them getting stroke. If people have a stroke today, you treat the stroke with clot busting uh, and other interventions. In the old days, you let them sit and lie on a bed and if they got better, they did. If they didn't, they didn't. So things have you know, changed dramatically um, and the outcome for patients are brilliant. You know, kidney diseases, massive out there um, and we don't even know about it we're just finding that out diabetes is massive and half the people who've got diabetes don't know they've got it so by being able to uh, identify um, a population within a practice or a population within a hospital practice or within a local government area you can actually start saying to people you know um, messages that get them to think more about it. It doesn't mean being intrusive in their life, but sends a signal. What do we want? Do, are you across the fact you might have a, a high rate of, of heart disease or a high rate of uh, diabetes or a high rate of kidney disease? How about you go and get a check about it and let's make sure you're okay. And if you are, great. If you're not, let's get you better. And if you're at a high risk, let's reduce that risk. Now, being a general practitioner, you're ideally placed to really look at the entire patient journey. And obviously, you can see where that uh, data can not only be used to improve their health before um, chronic disease or, or significant disease comes along. Where do you think it comes in towards the end when they're really sort of uh, experiencing the the, the the you know the negative sides of health yeah. where does ai fit into that because yeah. i can see where the preventative is so useful uh do you think that there's more work that needs to be done at the back end i, I think it's to me it's 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 the uh the, the golden uh, goal in this whole area um because you know, it's, of course, prevention is important. Of course, uh, it's important to do things early. But ultimately, people get sick and the health system were there to look after people when they're sick. So first of all, the, in, the information is very bitty. It's all over the place. You can't put it together. Uh, and that's many ways what we do in general practice, bring multiple sources of information into one source of truth, the patient record, uh, which we now want to share with the patient, and there are ways of doing that. Um, and that means that they've got better information. They've got better information about what choices they have and interventions that they can take. And be what uh, a lovely lady once said to me uh, at a conference uh, when I was with the World Medical, World Health, uh, World Medical Association at a, in Geneva at the World Health Organization is, I want to be the CEO of my health. So I want to look after all of my health needs. I want to be the CEO. I want you, people around there who are looking after me to give me the information. I, uh, and but I want to be able to then use the dashboard that you provide me to make the right change for me. That's how you use technology, uh, that's how you use AI, because we'll now be able to have a better idea of uh, which is the right sort of drug for you based on uh, the population, the demographics, and the more it becomes available by decoding the, the genome. As a general practitioner, you've obviously got experience across a huge range of, of ailments and, and different types of people that you're seeing. What sort of pushback are you getting from the, I guess, the patients, the end users about the use of AI and their health? I was um, uh, very lucky to be part of a PhD student's uh, thesis on the use of technology in, um, in practice. Um, and uh, she did a paper which is just about to be published which showed that people, um, when walked through the technology, don't get scared by the technology and thrive with it. If they just think it's a machine, that's another thing that's going to confuse me and I'm going to look stupid, I'm going to look old, I'm going to look like a fuddy-duddy and that I, I shouldn't be doing using technology, that should be for my grandchildren or my children, um, but you can turn it around and support people, they actually embrace it. Um, there is a whole generation of people out there who are really good using technology. Um, my mother will use a, an iPhone, uh, she will use a, um, a, a tablet, she will use a PC, um, she will use many of the apps on there to communicate all around the world um, in her 80s. And, you know, this is the testament to this generation of octogenarians um, and they're really good at it um, and they need to, be, need to be supported to do it. And so when these machines are clumsy because they're so small, the buttons, or the, the machines are um, just getting confusing messages, it needs to be decoded. And, of course, everyone can use it, but they'll need coding. And, you know, you teach people, you 
don't, don't like the word train, that's what you do for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you teach people how teach to do things people, and support, yes. support them um, and reinforce the messages, then they keep doing it. Because yeah. this is really confusing out there, but you can make it achievable. And it's not just about healthcare because it's like with any sector, you sit down and you teach people how to use something and you show them the benefits, then obviously it's easy to roll those things out. Absolutely. The, the whole piece around change management is important for us as clinicians. But actually, change management is what we all uh, thrive from and benefit from in the community. But it's a bit scary to go there. So you need someone to hold your hand through it. Uh, in many ways, that's what we can do as GPs, but not so much the GPs uh, uh, themselves, but people who work with them, the, the um, reception staff, the uh, managers, the uh, 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 allied health staff that work with us, the, the, and also uh, potentially um, a patient concierge in a practice who can help with some of these things that are becoming intrinsic to daily practice. Well, I think you've just solved the problem of jobs in Australia because we've just created an entire sector and industry, which is once AI med really starts to hit the patient journey, it's those educators, the specialists who walk in and train people, not train, educate people to use the functions and the apps that are going to ultimately make their lives better and, and, and use AI for the power of good. Totally. That's fantastic. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about um, your experience um, working with the development of AI Med because you've got a, a lot of experience. You were formerly the national clinical lead at the NITA. Could you tell us a little bit about that role and I guess where we are compared to when you were in that role compared to now and into the future? Sure. So NITA, the National eHealth Transition Authority, uh, was set up by COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, and the board was each director of every health department in the country and state and territory, as well as the federal secretary general, uh, the, the, the federal uh, secretary of the health department. Um, and so it had a pretty good um, uh, potential to drive health in a joined up way across the country. Uh, my job previously as national president of the AMA was to bank them. Uh, which I did very, very well, I've got to say. Um, so when I finished at the AMA, <laughs> the um, CEO at the time, Ian Reinecke, said to me, um, OK, you've had a go at us, now come and help us. So I, I thought that's a good challenge, so I, I did. Um, and so I started there in uh, 2007 and I finished in 2013. Um, and it was really a, an enlightening journey uh, around the world. So I've seen technology used in health um, in many great places around the world. I brought that technology and that knowledge to Australia. Um, and in many ways, I drove what was the precursor of what currently is in my health record, uh, bringing together the community. You know, if you said to somebody, what would you like on a health record? Everyone's got a different idea. Uh, they all think it's a fantastic idea, but it's, you know, it's got to be there, theirs. If you go to the hospitals in Australia and you say, you know what, uh, GPs are crying out for a discharge summary when somebody's admitted to casualty or to hospital so they know what's happened when they come home, everyone says, absolutely, we need uh, a summary discharge letter. Um, and it should be the same. But each of the 750 hospitals around the country will say, it has to be the same, but you know what, it's got to be my way. <laughs> and we've actually got to get a national standard which still hasn't happened, by the way, um, that makes that not that way. So, so what we did was, um, in terms of a health record, we could understand the benefits of people having information about their care so they can make better decisions about their own health care. And that when they went from different provider to different, to different provider, there was a good steer about that health care so they can make better informed decisions with information that was there. Um, so I said, that's the, that was the dream. Um, uh, and there's still a long way to achieve the dream, but we, some of the building blocks are there. Uh, what we did was bring together the community. So for me, I learned something from Hong Kong, where there were some uh, fantastic people in the Hong Kong Health Authority who did what was called co-piloting. So Andre Gellin, the late Andre Gellin, was a great uh, ICT guru, um, and N.T. Chung was the clinician. They got together and said, we're going to co-pilot this. So you get the clinicians and the technologists understanding what the clinicians need and what makes their life difficult. The techno technologists saying, this is what we can make it work for you. Uh, in Australia, we I coined the term the four-cornered round table, where I brought those two folks to, around the table, plus the government side, the uh, decision makers, who can look at funding, about privacy, about whether it needs to go to TGA or other authorities to make sure that these things are safe for clinical use, um, and then also going to the community, the, the, clinic, the, 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 the patients of Australia. Um, and we, over the course of three four-cornered round tables, we got pretty good alignment about what we were aiming for. Um, and uh, that's how we got the concept of, of operations for the what was called the PCHR, my health, uh, my personally controlled electronic health record. The evolution from there to um, uh, my health record has seen a few stumbles and, and falls over, actually. And I think we're still dusting ourselves off 
and looking up and saying, well, what more, more do we need to do? But it's not all about my health record. It's not about records. It's about the use of the information and data that we can garner from across the sector um, to give us good tools about how we manage patients, you know, how you use the data for clinical research, how the clinical research can um, can direct the best outcomes for patients by interventions you put in. And for patients as well, where can I get the information to look after my health better? I'm very curious about this experience that you had uh, worldwide. And I'm going to ask you a big question, which is, who does it best? Which country has really nailed it when it comes to maximising the efficiency of a health record? Mm. It's really interesting... Um, uh, we did a lot of work with the UK system Connecting for Health, uh, which had its own significant problems uh, around the same time that we're going through this journey. Um, and uh, NHS England has actually started to copy what I think is one of the best systems, which is NHS Scotland. And NHS Scotland kept it simple. Uh, so at the end of every day, whatever a GP had got about a patient's electronic uh, uh, medication management requirements was sent up to a central database. So no matter where you end up, it ends up in Scotland, in a casualty department or in a GP practice, and you didn't know what your medications were, at least you knew what that was, which is a major part of uh, mishaps and misadventures and um, bad outcomes in, in the medical sector. You also knew allergies. Um, and so the data set was that and another, very sim simple. And the clinical leads from NHS Scotland were amazing. The chief medical officer there was there as well. And what I've only... That's okay, we can edit it out, don't worry. Sorry, what, ha <laughs> what happened was my watch isn't on... Um, it's not very AI. Theatre the the mode, so I've got to switch, <laughs> switch that off as well. So, so this, this one... How many different devices? <laughs> yeah, well, so you were saying um, yeah. in terms of the, the Scotland model yeah. and how it's been... So, so um, what I've only recently um, gleaned here in Australia is from uh, Professor uh, Sir John Saville, who's just come to the University of Melbourne to run the... Melbourne Academic Centre for Health, is that using that database, that data set within Scotland, um, of every single diabetic, they reduced the level of blindness by 40%. Said again, they reduced the rate of blindness in diabetics by 40%. They re reduced the amputations by a significant staggering amount. So it means that you don't have to you know, boil the ocean and have the world's all singing, all dancing system uh, th 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 that's being envisaged in previous iterations like you know, Health Smart in Victoria or what's happening in, in, in some of these other implementations. You just need to do simple things, you know, to get messages across uh, from one place to the other. You know, secure messaging has not happened to this day in Australia, despite the fact that tomorrow they could get messages across to every provider like they do in Queensland because they've done it by using one technology. Um, you can therefore glean better information about what's happening to patients. So these things are um, possible. So Scotland is very good. Um, Denmark used to lead the pack, but uh, unfortunately has dropped the ball recently, I understand. Um, but they were doing some great stuff with secure messaging and, and a, a single record. Lombardia, believe it or not, in north of Italy, has done a really good job not using any very much government money at all because they used a commercial model. Um, and they were doing some good stuff there. Sweden started to get into that space as well. Um, and so there are pockets around the place. But, you know, the problem is that if you just make it technology-driven, you've lost the, the, the benefit. If you make it just clinically-driven, um, you're not going to understand what you can actually do and how you should do it better. That's why you're going to get them both together. And if you're trying to boil the ocean and be the U-Butte and get the best technology ever, you're never going to get there because it always changes. So you've got to you know, button down the hatch and do something very simple and build. Give people a, a taste which they're comfortable with, they'll enjoy it, they'll want more and they'll ask for more and they'll support you. If you give them this u -butte system, they're just going to say, shut us down, I'm not interested, it's too hard, I'm happy with my system, gr uh, grizzling though I will about how uh, bitty it is and how uh, non-iterative it is, I don't care, I just want to get on and use what I'm doing. What you're telling me is too hard. So you've got to work with the psychology of the individuals, both the clinicians and the technology people. You've got to work with the, um, the parameters that politicians have to live with and governments uh, and government departments. But most importantly, you've got to understand that the population is ready for this. 
you know, Australia is advanced. It's one of the most advanced nations for the adoption of technology. You know, our use of uh, smart devices is significant. You know, our broadband might not be the same as um, uh, you know, the Baltic republics, but we do some great stuff with what we've got. And there's a lot more we can do. We're in a great place with great people, uh, with great skills, um, and a great ecosystem within our community uh, with a, you know, 180 different nationalities within our midst that we can actually outreach to the other 180 nations outside the, our country and just make things happen because we've got, you know, one of those universal passports. It sounds to me like it's almost we are ripe and ready to start in embracing the technology. Is that why it's such a perfect time for AI Med to start to come to Australia and start bringing everybody into the room and really having that uh, collaborative discussion because I, my understanding is that that that's what makes AI Med conferences different. It's the collaboration. Is that something you're looking forward to? Yeah. Look, I, I think that um, we are in the right place at the right time. I think that um, we are looking at a refresh of what we're doing with the use of technology uh, in, in across the, the nation in the community anyway, but in health in particular. In health, we are seeing what's called a fiscal a uh, cliff that we're about to fall off because the costs are um, unsustainable. We are in a position where we've got good people with good skills from the clinical side that were willing to buy into this and um, be, um, I used to call myself an evangelist. Other people would say uh, that they're advocates, um, but that's important. Uh, we've got great people, you know, our technologists are, are uh, using systems which are being used worldwide, things like fire invented here in Australia. Um, uh, we should be supporting our industry. You know, I have the joy of being a director of the MedTech Actuator, which is bringing startups within Australia to, uh, with um, venture capital to a position of maturity to become blossoming startups in IT in this country. You know, um, uh, one of the things that struck me about the fantastic um, utopia that started again is the previous episode in a, in a previous series said um, that they, they were saying to a whole lot of technologists, what can we do in government to help you? And they said, get out of our way. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. Well, I was going to ask you about that, actually, because when you were describing all the collaboration and all these wonderful minds and, uh, you know, futuristic ideas, at no stage did you actually mention government. Yeah. And it sounds to me as though um, the private sector has a lot to give in terms of the advancement of this. And maybe we shouldn't be looking necessarily to the government to fund it or to uh, set legislation, aside from privacy, of course, that's yeah. very important. Is that something you would agree with? Yeah, look, I, look I've, I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship, I guess, with governments. Um, uh, I, I work with all levels of government. I've worked with ministers and oppositions. I've worked with um, government heads of department and work with the worker bees uh, within departments because to me you've got to get everybody uh, on side uh, and on, on uh, in tune and that's what I think made a big difference um, and I won't go into the details of that but people who have heard of me and heard of this will know what I'm talking about um, uh, that we actually have made a difference by working with every level of government. They do have a role, they are enablers. Uh, they can um, be blockers. If they decide they don't like something, they can make life really difficult. But they can be enablers. And you know, you do need some funding to make this thing work. You do need the, ra the rail gauges to be able to run the tracks, the, the, the vehicles along. Um, and of course, we don't have rail tracks anymore. We don't have, have roads, we're gonna have flying cars. So that's the thing, we're moving from that different paradigm. So there is a role for government. Um, and it's not all about legislation and, and being a blocker, but it's about seeing the potential and, uh, and, and, and making things work. You know, I think that, you know, with our current health minister, with the MRFF, um, the, the future fund that we have, um, he's done some stuff in this in this area. And I think he's got a great capacity to do that. Um, in in the, the, the national government with the futures fund, there is money for innovation and, and seed funding. I think that's a very important part of what we can do and what we should do. But ultimately, um, I think that uh, you have to allow people to flourish. Um, when I finished with the eHealth Authority, um, I didn't want anything to do with the agenda for quite some time. And one of my friends said, you must come and see something called MedTech's Got Talent, which was a whole lot of MedTech startups doing some work. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. It's going to be the same old you know, story, just a different day. And I went there and I was amazed about how amazingly talented uh, and focused and um, innovative people were. And the answer was the government was not in the room. Yes. They are now in the room because they can see it, but they're not the big brother in the room and the big hand of the tiller. They're enablers. They're enablers. Exactly. And then I think that's a really key word to use there. 
So speaking in terms of the AI Med Summit, of course, in November, uh, we've got uh, lots of clinicians and collaborators coming into the room. What do you think that they can expect from such a conference? I think that the main thing uh, is that the, the conference brings people together uh, with uh, an open mind and an open heart and a and wide open eyes, uh, thinking about the future, uh, you know, mind open, uh, not hopefully locked in, leave the baggage at the door, um, let yourself do a bit of free thinking. This is a conference to come away from your day to day work where you've got to you know head down, bottom up, and get on. Uh, it's very much um, blue sky thinking horrible thing, people use it too much, but that's what it is, uh, thinking outside the box, again, hackneyed term, um, but just feast on ideas of others and give your own uh, goodies into that feast. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr Heikewal. You've, you've laid the foundation over many years for this to occur through all of your efforts and your work at all levels of government and, and you know, within the industry. Um, I think it's a very exciting time. I definitely agree with you. And I, I'd like to thank you for joining AI Med Talks to talk about this and get people excited about the AI Med Conference in November. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for the opportunity and good luck with the conference. You've been speaking to Alexi Boyd with AI Med Talks. You can find us online Line and uh, through the links to find and listen to this great podcast as well as lots of others. We will see you at the AI Med Conference in November.